Hey friends, so I recently did uh, a cover of I Wish by Stevie Wonder. <laughs> Spotify and it's on YouTube. If you want a play along track and sheet music and all that stuff, uh, you can buy the sheet music outright if you'd like to. Also available uh, to Patreon donors. Just a few points I want to talk about today. The form isn't what's making this interesting. If I just played all the right notes and rhythms, it's probably not going to be that interesting to listen to. So. Well, that's articulation. That's just one of them. And by the way, where is that short note? It could be. It could be the first one, it could be the second one. It could be the third one. It could be the fourth one. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just you, so that's a musical decision. And these are the things that most students don't think about. Uh, kind of not even until after an undergraduate degree. Are, are you really thinking about where your expressive moment is. So, for a song like this, articulation is a huge, huge factor. The beginning of the second verse, it's the same exact melody, right? But what am I gonna do? Uh, in this one I go... Something like that. That's like a pitch inflection. There's also like a, a tone inflection. I could... I could like kind of growl into it. So, articulation, pitch inflection, tone inflection. Of course, there's dynamic shift. Like having like loud and then quick soft or any of that. In the second verse, there's a moment where I went. It kind of comes out of the texture. So that's a dynamic uh, inflection that I'm adding. And then finally, uh, time. You can play right on the beat. You can play kind of a little relaxed, or you can play really relaxed. I just talked about this in uh, the New Orleans video I did, if you haven't seen that, uh, the collab Cross America New Orleans video. The tuba, which is acting as the bass, and the uh, drums are, are locking in right where the tempo is, and he's playing after it basically every single time. So that super, super relaxed style of swing is just so much New Orleans. In funk music like this, it's super an option. I mean, there's plenty of times where Stevie Wonder is singing way after the beat. So those are all the little spices that I have allowed myself to add, which is what makes this interesting to listen to, even though it's all a bunch of the same notes. Now in this tune, the first half, I'm just playing the melody basically exactly the way I heard Stevie Wonder do it. I've transcribed it out exactly. The second time, now I'm adding a lot of stuff. I'm also filling in a lot of the spaces. So let's look at one of the changes I made in the second half. And then we go back into the... Goes back into the melody, but it, there's this departure which is totally based on the melody, but kind of like adding this this heightened thing, it turns it into a much longer phrase. What's happening here? It's all pentatonic. <laughs> That's all it is. Why does this sound so good? Because the pentatonic scale sounds amazing over everything. If I want to play this all in one go and not make it sound super like separated, what I'll do is I'll actually play the E flat and then keep my lips on the horn and like breathe in through my nose, but not reset my lips. And that's going to allow me to play that whole phrase with my lips set up for the high thing, but basically forcing myself to play a lower note set up for a high E flat. If you play that E flat first, you can see how you know what it's going to feel like. And if you set yourself up for the lower notes and then having to tense, tense, tense up to the E flat because you're gonna reach your limit and you can't tense anymore, even though you have to keep getting higher. And then this long phrase after this is another version of this where uh, I have to go all the way up to a D flat and I like it being one long phrase. It doesn't have to be a short phrase version of this would be something like, that would allow you to set up each time for the higher 
one, like reset, 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 reset. But I like it being a long phrase. <laughs> You have to set up for the D flat and then lower it back down. It's the same principle here. So it just takes a lot of kind of discipline to look at that phrase and know I have to set up for a high D flat, even though I'm starting down here on a just middle B flat. And then there's so many little inflection things that are happening during that. It's not just all the right notes and the right rhythms. First one, I'm playing super short. And then long, 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 long. So letting the tongue re-articulate in the middle of the gliss or just glissing. So do you hear the tongue? Maybe not. The air never stops. The tongue is just kind of kind of in the middle. Ra, 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 ra. Not ta, 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 ta. Ra, 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 ra or without the tongue at all. So here's with the tongue once and without the tongue at all. So even with this thing where it's literally just pentatonic, 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 just stepping up one each time and not changing the rhythm, I am changing the uh, articulation and style for each one. Those are the choices that you have to make and ideally before you get to it, but at least as you're trying to do it, you should know what you're trying to do. If I were practicing this for a live performance, I would write in every single one of those. And if I change my mind in the practice or in the dress rehearsals or any of that, I would make that decision to know in the performance exactly the way I'm going to try to do it. That way when it comes to one of these notes and I play it really, really short, it's because I meant to. It's because that's how I wanted it to go. And then nothing's gonna get stale because I've figured out how I wanna communicate this to the audience. And you can also tell how it's not just short or long, it's everything in between. I do have some of those classical long stuff, but there's also some with daylight in between. There are some that are absolutely bit off, shorter than you would ever play in classical music. I'm biting off the note with my tongue. They literally tell you in school, do not do that. Do not bite the note off with your tongue. Well, in funk music, it sounds great. I mean, how short is that? You would never do, I'm literally stopping it with my tongue. In the classical conservatory method, if you stop a note with your tongue as your, your short note, don't do that. They will yell at you. They'll be like, that is wrong, bad technique. Well, no, it's not bad technique. If you're trying to make this percussive sound that has pitch. Oh, well, that's, that's the way to do it, right? So if this is staccato and this is legato, there's something over here past staccato that is available as like a color palette. That's what makes it interesting to listen to. And it's not just right notes and rhythms. Now, in the second half of this, I'm also adding notes. I'm adding improvisational stuff. So I'm actually writing new melodies as well, or I'm changing the rhythm, even if it's the same melody from verse one, I'm changing the rhythm of the same melody. That's obviously not available a lot of the time in the music we're playing. You're not allowed to just like rewrite the rhythms um, or even the notes, but you do have all of this other stuff available. What about the background parts? With the melody, I'm changing these articulations left and right. Well, with the background parts, we have a lot of times three or four parts that are playing the same rhythms in unison. And if one of them's playing it long and one of them's playing it short, it's not gonna work, right? The articulations have to be uniform. So that's not your place to have your artistic stamp. If you're gonna play it short, everybody plays it short. If you're gonna play it long, everybody plays it long. So for example, these backgrounds during the verse. I'm playing some of those short. I'm gonna play them all short though, on all of the parts. Ba, 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 but in between the notes, in the transitions of the notes, well, now there's actually something I can do because everybody's in a transition. And so that's where I actually do, you'll hear it in the, in the track, a little bit of a growl and a little bit of a gliss. And then at the end, did you hear it? A little forte piano crescendo growing out of it. It's in the transitions where some sort of creativity can uh, add a lot 
to an arrangement. You're not going to want to do a ton of vibrato. You're not going to want to do a ton of other inflections, but in between the transitions. I'll play it one more time. Even if the other parts aren't doing exactly that, forte piano crescendo or glissy uh, growl, having that kind of come out of the texture and then back into this unison short rhythm, it's going to sound great. And if you listen to the recording, I think you'll agree. Next, I want to talk about the range issues in this. I wrote this in the original key and I transcribed the original horn parts, which of course are played on trumpets for a lot of these really high things. And I had them down an octave and it totally works down the octave, but it does go kind of in front of the melody, especially during the chorus. I was like, well, I'll just play it up in the trumpet range. And that's not something that you're ever going to see in something that isn't a Christopher Bill arrangement. <laughs> so I thought we'd talk about like how I'm doing it, how I practice it. Then if you ever need to play anything that's kind of ridiculous, it's not that hard. So I have these backgrounds leading into the chorus, which have crazy jumps because you're playing a trombone part and then a trumpet part and then back to a trombone part. Right? Basically, if you're playing, let's say, like the most comfortable note you have, uh, maybe it's middle F, maybe it's concert B flat, you don't have to worry about setting yourself up for that note. Okay, here comes the B flat. <gasps> you just go, all right, B flat, I got that one. But why can you do that? It's because you've played that note a million times. Every single time you play that, you're teaching your physical body what it feels like to put your lips in a certain configuration. But through playing notes like this uh, over the course of 15 years making these videos and putting a ton of high stuff in, I've had to play them over and over and over, way more than you would ever play these notes if you were just playing normal music. So when I get to that C, I can then jump to the D flat because I know what it feels like to play that. I've done it so much. So how do you do it? Well, you start playing stuff up in that register all the time. And if that's too high for you, you just transpose it down and you work your way up. I have a lesson course on range building where you literally pick the note that is just a little bit outside of your comfort range. Not the one that you can't play, but the one that you can play, it's just a little uncomfortable. And the idea is to get that into your comfortable range rather than learning how to play all new notes way up in the register that's like outside of your range. Speaking of, if we go to the chorus, uh, this is a bunch of high G flats and E flats, which are both pretty annoying notes to pick out of thin air. So down an octave. Find it first. The thing about a G flat, because at this register, you really have to be sure you want to write it. And a G flat is really just an F sharp. And in trombone world, we have high F. That's a note that has been written for our instrument. It's a scary high note, but we know it. And if you saw it, you'd be like, oh, it's got a high F in it. But it's not like a, oh, what are you doing writing a high F? It's like, okay, I got to work up to it. Like, people play it. It's not a note that is unavailable. So why is an F sharp unavailable? It's so close. If you can play an F, you just, you just an F sharp. Now I've written it as a G flat. Feels like it's a higher note. It's really not that bad. It feels very similar to a high F. So if you have a high F, you basically have an F sharp. The way I like to work up to a note like that is to ground myself in an octave below and do a rip up. It really helps. It's so, so much easier, for me anyway, than just picking it out of thin air, even if I'm setting up for it. Uh, really helpful. The fact that you don't have to stay on it very long in this song makes it a lot easier. You can actually kind of miss it some of the times I noticed, and it's okay because it's it's mostly the effect of it falling from that note. The real problem here is not playing it. It's playing it so many times in a row 
and having the endurance to do it. I'm not going to teach you a lesson and be like, yeah, no, just just practice a lot and then G flats won't be a problem. Like, it's it takes a long time to build up the muscles uh, to be able to do that, first of all, at all, let alone consistently. Not to drive traffic to my lesson course available on Patreon. For $15 a month, you get access to all of my courses uh, at the $15 tier or higher, uh, or you could buy them outright, patreon.com slash classical trombone. But uh, I have these courses that build up to it. If you can't play the G flat, again, find a note where you can play it sometimes and then start trying these little rips. Uh, I think you'll find that you can play higher than you think you can if you ground your embouchure into something that is really solid. So if maybe the highest note you could play consistently is like an A, and then you're gonna try to get up to the B flat. Get a bunch of those in, there's the A. That's the one you can play every day. And then go to the B flat. And just start going up from there. And I will recommend not moving the slide. So I just played the B natural and fourth position rather than going four to two. Uh, keep it in the same slide position. Be kind to yourselves. Don't uh, hammer on it. Like, it depends on the day. You only have so much endurance in the muscles in your face. You really can't force it. You might just have to take a break. You might have to take the day off. I want to show you this really tricky passage that leads into the chorus. You only have so many high notes in a day. So the way to do this is to play it down an octave until I have it in my ear so strong, not just the notes, but those syncopations and those jumps. You don't want to waste those really high chops on a practice run. So there's just a little hesitation on that second measure. I'm not really sure where that tie, it comes in from the last 16th and that ties to the and of two. So it's from a syncopation to a syncopation. It's a little awkward. So the way to practice this, again, down the octave, you don't want to practice this up the octave, your chops will be gone, is um, take the tie out. So it's there's two ties, I'm gonna take them both out. Okay, perfect, easy actually. Uh, so now I'm gonna put the first tie and I'm gonna keep it from that last 16th note, but then take out the second tie. Actually pretty good as well. Uh, so now I'm going to put that last tie back in, but I'm gonna do a little crescendo, this little like push on that last eighth note that it's you know tied into to kind of imply where that note is as if I'm articulating it. Right, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, really shows me where that note is and keeps the rhythm rather than having it be ambiguous the whole time. I'm gonna do that a couple more times and then take out that little push and see if I can still feel where that's supposed to be. Okay, that feels really good. So now I'm gonna try it straight without that weird little push at the end, but I think I've played it enough times where I can feel it now. I can hear the pitches. I've worked out that weird accidental thing. If I had played that that many times to get it up an octave, I don't stand a chance. So now I'm ready to take it up an octave and worry about accuracy. And hopefully all of that stylistic work I just did uh, stays true. Feels really good. Uh, and it's just because we practiced it the correct way first rather than just jumping in and being like, I can play some D flats, I can play an F, let's give it a shot. No, 
make sure you have your foundation of style and articulation and melody and rhythm before you even try to add that really difficult element of like, okay, now do it with some 50 pound weights. And for me, that's exactly how I'm gonna practice something like this. All right, the last thing I wanna check out is this really flashy triplet break going into the ending. It's actually in the original track. It's just really far in the back on like some keys. And I cut, you know, the, the whole track and just highlighted this cool line. The way to practice this is in little, little chunks, you know, just to get the accuracy. Groups of three plus one. So the first one. So the second one. So the third one. So the fourth one. I add the plus one, it bridges that gap uh, between each little thing I've practiced. But honestly, more importantly, it's a lot easier to keep it in time if you add that one. Da -ba -da -da. Da -ba -da -da, because it forces you to play all of the notes in that beat before you get to the next beat and you can't lie to yourself and be like, oh, I, I basically got there. No, no, no. If there's another beat coming, you have to play all of the notes before you get there. Da -ba -da -da. So I love adding the plus one. So now the second thing, of course, you've put two of them together. So I'm going to do six plus one, six plus one. And now I, I guess I would do nine plus one and then the second nine plus one. So that would be. And then we put it all together. But unfortunately, that was the slow version. The fast version, I'm going to tongue it the way I will tongue it when it's too fast for me to single tongue it. Doing it in those small chunks. But fast forward and it's more. And then uh, let's, let's try six plus one. I'm not super confident in how that felt, so I'm actually gonna do a rolling six, which is starting with the first one, starting with the second one, starting with the third, starting with the fourth. There's no transition that I haven't done at tempo and can't do. So now let's try nine. And do the whole thing. I've said this a million times, and you'll hear it a million more times in these videos, but there's only two ways to practice something. You slow it down, you cut it up into little chunks, or the secret third way, both. If it's just the technique and accuracy, and you can play all of the notes out of context, well, that's easy. Just uh, grab your metronome, cut it up in small chunks, and slow it down. Well, thanks for coming along. I hope you learned something. I know I did. Uh, if you like this kind of thing, and again, if you want to check out the play along track and play this song along with me, uh, come on over to Patreon uh, for the $15 a month tier and more. You get access to all that, a whole bunch of sheet music stuff, as well as all of my lesson courses. That includes the range building courses. That includes my major scale and arpeggio boot camp. That includes all my music theory courses, as well as my 10 hour plus intensive arranging course. Thank you all of the Patreon donors who are making all these videos possible. Patreon.com slash classical trombone. Uh, find me at classical trombone on all the things. Also, I wish the Stevie Wonder Brass cover is on Spotify. Go check it out. Thanks for watching. See y'all real soon. Bye.